This happened just a few days ago. I'm a 26-year-old female who recently went through a bad breakup. Brian is my ex-boyfriend, 32 years old and kind of preppy. He definitely never seemed to be the kind of guy that would have done what he did. Josh is my friend. He is a 38-year-old bro who never grew up. I had known him for some time and we had always been friends, but since he was never serious about anything, I wasn't actually into him. The guy that I had broken up with was crazy. He started to get very controlling and would call me at all hours of the night to see what I was doing. After the breakup, he was even worse. It went as far as stalking me and one night he tried to grab me, but I managed to get away. Because of that, I now always keep pepper spray in my purse. Like I said, I was feeling bummed out from my recent breakup, so me and a bunch of friends went out to try and have a good time. Of course, Josh came along. He never missed a chance to get wasted. We hopped a few bars, then went dancing. Throughout the night, guys would come up to me to offer to buy me a drink or ask me to dance. I wasn't in the mood, so I always declined. The thing is that Josh was never far from me, and every time a guy came up to ask, he would get this weird look on his face. By the end of the night, I was pretty drunk and in no shape to drive. When I asked for a ride, Josh jumped at the chance to take me home. I'll be honest, I was a little sketched out by this. For one, it was odd that he had remained sober all night. For two, the looks he was giving the other guys kind of creeped me out. But since all of my friends were taking cabs home in the opposite direction from where I lived, I had no choice. Josh had parked at the first bar we went to which by that point was about a mile or so away. I had to steady myself on his arm as we went. It was about five minutes into the walk when he brought up how he had always liked me and never understood why I didn't seem interested in him. I tried to explain as nicely as possible. It was because he was kind of a loser, but in my drunken state, I don't think it came out very nicely. He began to insist that we would be good for each other. Every time I had to turn him down, it got really annoying. So much so that I told him I would find another ride home. When I let go of him to turn around, he grabbed me by my arm hard. He told me I couldn't go back and I had to stay close to him. That did it. I blew up at him and started calling him names. Then he grabbed me again and forced me to walk. It must have been a sight, me flailing my arms, yelling at him, him pushing me down the street. After a bit, we both heard footsteps running down the sidewalk towards us and a fist flew from nowhere and clocked Josh in the jaw. I screamed and dropped my purse. Josh was on the ground, moaning in pain, and before me was Brian, my ex-boyfriend. Brian slapped me across the face. I dropped hard since I could barely stand already. He tried to kick me, but Josh grabbed his leg. On the ground not far from me, I saw my purse. It took me a few tries to get to it since I was seeing double, but eventually I had it in my hand and grabbed out the pepper spray. Both Josh and Brian were rolling on the ground. I had no choice but to spray them both. They started screaming so loud that I think that's when someone called the cops. Josh and I wouldn't let Brian get away and the police finally came to pick him up. Later, Josh explained that he thought he had seen Brian at the first bar we had gone to, but wasn't sure it was him and didn't want to ruin my night. He decided to stay sober just in case anything happened though. When we were walking back to his car, he noticed someone following us. He hoped that by hearing he was my boyfriend that Brian might get the clue and leave us alone. He didn't tell me that we were being followed so I wouldn't go back there and start something. That's also why he wouldn't let me turn around to go back when I wanted to leave. When the police checked Brian's car, they found duct tape, a can of kerosene, zip ties, a box of matches, and a 22 caliber pistol, fully loaded. It's insane to think of what he would have done if he had gotten me alone. Brian was such a super creep. Being with Josh now is like a breath of fresh air. This one time, I went to a house party. Ended up meeting a girl there and we hit it off. She was a little odd, but I liked her style. Anyways, we started hanging out regularly. At first, everything seemed fine. Then she began to get more and more distant. I thought maybe she was losing interest wasn't happy with it, but it happens. Until one day I started getting weird phone calls from her number. When I would pick up, there was a long silence. Then it sounded like crying in the distance. This went on for a while. I began to ignore them, but then they went to voicemail. It would be two minutes of her crying. 
Eventually, the crying became a sobbing laugh, which was even creepier. Finally, I thought about it and decided that maybe she was in some kind of danger, so I called her. When she answered, she sounded completely sketched out. She talked really fast and barely made any sense. Maybe I watched too many movies, but the first thing that came to my mind was that she was being held hostage or something and couldn't talk freely. I went to her house after work to check up on her. It was nighttime, and all the lights in her place were off. I would have thought that she wasn't home, but her car was in the driveway, and her door was open to crack. Went up to the door and knocked. There was no answer, so I called out her name. Footsteps could be heard shuffling around upstairs, and I decided to go in to check it out. I found the light switch at the entrance on the wall and flicked the lights on. Once I could see, it was obvious something was wrong. The place looked like a mess and on the walls there were weird things written in sharpie markers. The words, they're watching, was written over and over again along with strange patterns and designs I had never seen before. Grotesque figures of people were drawn everywhere as well. They were disproportionate and all of them had a single eye. Some of the eyes were on the forehead, but some were on their hands or stomach. It made no sense. I then went upstairs to check on the sound I had heard earlier. The light in the hallway didn't turn on when I used the switch. Using the flashlight on my phone, I looked down the hall. There was broken glass everywhere. Bloody footprints led to the last room on the right. I called out her name again. All I got in response was more sounds of whimpering. By this time, even though slightly confused, I didn't think there was any danger. It didn't seem like there was anyone in the house besides her, but maybe she had been hurt and left or something. I followed the bloody prince down the hall, then entered the room. The smell was overwhelming. It smelled just like an open sewer. My light scanned the room slowly. In the corner I saw her huddled. She looked terrible. Her hair was matted and clumped. Some of it had been pulled out. She sat there hunched over, picking at her arm, which caused long trails of blood to flow to the floor. Shit and urine was all over the place, along with syringes littered everywhere. As I approached her, she started mumbling that I was one of them. As reassuring as I could be, I tried to comfort her. When I reached out to touch her, she hissed and scratched at me, then jumped up and clawed at my face. Her fingernails felt like fire as they raked down under my eyes. I tried to push her off but she was freakishly strong. She toppled me over and we rolled around in the shit and piss until she ended up on top of me. Her hands went around my neck as she tightened them. She was choking the life out of me. One of my hands frantically searched for anything I could use to defend myself as the other tried to push her away. Finally, I found one of the needles and stabbed her in the arm with it. This caused her to jump off from me and retreat back to her corner where she began to sob cry again. I wasted no time in running from the house to call the police. They came and got her and put her into drug rehab. I didn't press any charges because I just felt sorry for her. They said she had gotten into some kind of drug-induced psychosis or something and she didn't know what she was doing. To think that I had dated a druggie for over a month without cluing into the fact baffles me. I mean really, until that night where she almost killed me, she seemed mostly normal. I hope she gets good treatment for all this and can live a good life without me. I had been talking to this girl that works in my office for a while. We'll call her Sally. She was short with long brown hair and the richest brown eyes I have ever looked into. Seriously, it was like diving into a chocolate pool every time she looked at me. I never thought anything would come of it since she was married. But a few months ago, she started to come into work looking frazzled, and one day she had a black eye. She told me she got it by running into a shelf at home, but I've seen enough TV shows to know that is an excuse to cover up domestic abuse. Word around the workplace was that she was having trouble at home with her husband. She would come into work and her hair would be unkempt, or her clothes would look like she had slept in them. Her eyes would often be red and puffy as well, like she had been crying. The only reason I bring all this up is because when she came into work well dressed and looking kept, I took her at her word that she had gotten a divorce. I was already kind of into her and it was amazing when she began to come on to me. We would talk and flirt but I didn't want to do anything serious with her until she had some recovery time from her drama. That was until one night after work she came to me crying. I have never been able to handle it when a woman cries. 
My heart breaks for them and I try my best to cheer them up. She told me she needed someone to talk to and she didn't trust anyone else in the office not to spread rumors. So we went to a local bar for a drink. While there, she told me what had been going on, that her ex was a jerk and would abuse her both physically and verbally. We continued to talk for over two hours and the drinks kept coming. Sooner or later, we started to flirt. Hands touched, long gazes. I told a joke and she laughed with a laugh that rang like silver bells. Finally, it was getting late as we both stumbled out of the bar. I hailed her a cab and she was getting in when she pulled me close for a kiss. She then whispered in my ear, I don't want to be alone tonight. My inebriated mind didn't have time to think as she threw me into the cab with her. Our hands were all over each other on the short ride to her place. Once on the walk up to her apartment, she was tearing my tie off. My jacket got dropped somewhere and I lost a shoe. A quick fumble at her door with the keys and we were inside. I won't go into all the details, but it got hot and heavy. I should have seen all the signs. They were literally staring me in the face the whole time. We were uh, mid-coitus when I heard the front door open and feet rushed to the bedroom. Before I could even move, a pair of large, rough, strong hands grabbed me by the shoulders and threw me against the wall. It was her husband who was a mountain of a man, easily over six foot three and probably around 270. What the hell, Vince? Sally screamed. Vince started yelling at her that she was a cheating slut and crazy. I was rushing to get my clothes on when I heard Vince ask her if she was doing the abused wife game again. This caught my attention. I stopped with only one pants leg on and stared at her in disbelief. She couldn't even make eye contact with me. Vince walked off into another room while I finished getting dressed. All Sally said was, I'm sorry. Then I heard a shotgun being racked in the hallway. I ran from the room and out the front door without ever looking back. It's clear that Sally had lied about being divorced. The signs I had mentioned earlier, the ones that were staring me right in the face, there were pictures of her and Vince on the walls. There was even one on her nightstand. I mean, maybe she still kept them up? Or maybe she was trying to get back at Vince for all the stuff he did to her? Or it could even be that none of that was actually true. There was something in the way he had asked her about playing the abused wife game that threw doubts on everything she ever said. She never came back to work and I haven't seen her since. Either way, I don't appreciate being a pawn in someone else's twisted game, especially when it could have cost me my life. April, last year, met a girl while on spring break at a bar. She seemed sweet, kind of shy, but would make the wildest jokes out of nowhere, totally disarming in her mannerisms. We talked for a bit, and then she invited me back to her hotel. It wasn't far, and I let my friends know where I was going. We left around 11 p.m. It was 11.15 when we got back to her place. The room was trashed. It looked like someone had tried to rob it. She didn't seem too concerned about it, so I let it go. We sat on the bed and started to talk. Just small talk, really. Then she said she had to go to the bathroom. She went in and immediately turned on the faucet. I figured it was so I wouldn't hear her using the toilet, but then I heard her talking. Thinking she was on the phone, I didn't pay any attention to it. Began to look around a little. A drawer to her nightstand was wide open, so I looked inside. There were ID cards all with her picture on them, but they each had different names. Then I heard another voice in the bathroom with her. It was a deep voice, definitely male. It asked her if she was ready. By this point, I was sure I needed to get out of there. Made for the door, but the bathroom was right next to it, and before I could turn the handle, some guy reached out and grabbed me. He was strong and wiry, with fingers that squeezed so tight they felt like my arm was burning. I struggled to get free. I had never been so scared in my life. My arms went spastic and flailed about. Real fight or flight syndrome. I somehow managed to open the door a bit and yelled out the crack before getting pulled back in. We ended up on the ground. He was around my legs and she was on my chest. At some point I'm pretty sure I bit her. She wound up to slap me and that offset her just enough to where I could buck her off. I got a leg free and kicked the guy in the nose. Quicker than lightning, I was up and out into the hall. I began to bang on all the doors to cause as much noise as I could. Some people came out to see what was going on. When I looked back, I saw the couple that tried to get me running down the hallway with suitcases in hand. I went after them, now feeling braver with the crowd around me. 
They were so fast that they were outside the door and in their car before I could get there. When the cops came to get my statement, they searched the room I had been in. They found multiple fake IDs and surgical scalpels in one of the drawers. They're not entirely sure what was going on in there. Organ harvesting is only an internet myth from as much as I know. Could have been a sadistic couple into torturing victims, or cannibals. No one really knows. I just know that I am lucky to have made it out of that alive. Met a guy on Tinder a few months ago. Nothing really special about him. He seemed cute enough, I guess, but really, I only talked to him because I liked his dog. Made the mistake of giving him my phone number before we ever met. Like I said, there was nothing special about him. Nothing to give me pause either way about handing out my number. It was a few days later that he began to text me at weird hours, late at night or really early in the morning. Mainly messages asking how I was, what I was up to, and where I was. I ignored him at first, but then they started to come more frequently, than every hour. The guy couldn't take the hint that his dog had gotten him only so far. He went silent for a few days, and I thought the worst was over. That was until he started to send pictures of my car, where I worked, and even my house. I finally texted him back and told him to leave me alone or I'd call the police. He responded with, that was fine with him, they'd never catch him. The profile was fake and even the phone he was using wasn't his. He said I was his plaything now and I would never know when or where he would be. I showed the message to one of my friends and she said the guy was clearly psycho. No duh. I ended up telling the police, but there wasn't much they could do. They ran the phone number and it came back as a prepaid phone. They even went to find where it was purchased, but turns out someone used the stolen credit card to buy it. The Tinder profile was fake as well. That night, when I got home, there were flowers and a card for me on my kitchen table. The card said, To my toy, love, a secret admirer. I nearly had a heart attack. I've since changed my phone number and even moved. That took a huge bite out of my budget, but there was nothing else I could do. I don't use dating sites anymore. This whole thing has me on constant edge.